If you want to turn with me in your Bibles, our New Testament scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 15. And we'll be reading the last section of Mark 15. It's in verse 42 to 47. You can find it in your pew Bibles on page 853. Mark 15, beginning in verse 42. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid." So we continue then, uh, moving very quickly toward the end of this gospel. And uh, we've read of the death of Christ. Here he is buried. We talked last week about uh, how there's several mentions, especially in Mark, it seems, of those who followed Jesus or, or came to recognize who Jesus was. And it seems, uh, you know, that they're a, a bit unlikely. And this is maybe in some ways one of the most uh, unlikely of the group, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, we're, we're told some here in Mark, although Mark is a short gospel, it's usually very brief in what it says. If you look in the other gospel accounts, we learn a little bit more about Joseph as well. Uh, but we do learn here that he was a member of the council, that is, uh, the council of the Jewish leaders who had just condemned Jesus to die. He was a member of that council. And we're told elsewhere that uh, he uh, allowed the rest of the council to you know, condemn Jesus. He just, he did not stand in their way. And yet, he was, uh, you know, though a respected member of the council, he was also, it says, himself looking for the kingdom of God. And so he was in some way uh, secretly following Jesus, or at least wanted to, in some capacity. Uh, we're told again in uh, Luke's account that he would secretly follow Jesus. He just didn't want anyone else to know because he was afraid of the rest of the Jewish leaders. He was afraid of the rest of the council if they were to find out that he was following this man. And so he didn't do anything as they condemned him to death. So he had clearly, in some sense, been a kind of a coward. He was, he was so afraid of these Jewish leaders that he wouldn't do anything on behalf of Christ. He wouldn't even follow him outright, stand up for him in any way. But with the death of Christ, you see this change in Joseph. This probably was devastating to him, right? Because he knows who Jesus is. He at least thinks he does. He, he's been looking for the kingdom of God. He's been waiting for the Messiah. And he thinks Jesus is the Messiah. And now he had a hand in Jesus' death. But finally, it says that he took courage. He finally takes courage. And he goes in a very public way to go and ask for the body of Jesus. And it might not seem very public to us the way that we read it. It just maybe doesn't you know, come across the same way. But this was a very public act. Everybody was going to learn that he did this. Everybody was going to learn that he uh, took Jesus. And we learn elsewhere that the tomb that he lays him in was his own tomb. He took Jesus and he showed honor and respect to his body. It might have seemed like that wasn't a big deal because it was over. That's probably what Joseph thought himself. He thought, it, this is probably too late, but I'm still going to do what I can to show my reverence for this man. But he's dead now, so what will that actually mean? But it wasn't over. 
Although Pilate was surprised that Jesus was dead already, which means that Jesus died much faster than was common in crucifixion. Often, uh, men who were crucified would be hung on the cross for days because it would just be a slow death of suffocation. And so they could, they could last a while if they could keep themselves from suffocating. But eventually they would die. Jesus died very quickly. And in a sense, this makes it look like Jesus was particularly weak. He was weaker than most who would go to crucifixion. But it was in his weakness, which was not true weakness, right? He freely gave up his life. He freely chose to die. It was in that weakness that actually now you see someone like a Joseph of Arimathea able to find true strength, true courage. It's because of the weakness of Christ. And so if you've been cowardly or scared or ashamed of Christ... It's not, it's not too late. It's, it's not over. Right? Joseph still, he took courage at the end. He did finally come and, and honor Christ. And Christ still welcomes those who would do that. We know in part that you know, Joseph uh, was evidently continuing to follow Christ after this because he, he makes it in every gospel account. He shows up everywhere. Uh, he, was, he was well known by those who were reading the gospels originally. And so we too can take courage. We can take courage and strength in the weakness of Christ. He was weak that we might actually have strength. Today we're looking at Psalm 75. And so if you want to turn there with me in your pew Bibles, it's on page 487. I'll give you a moment to turn with me so you can follow along. Psalm 75, beginning in verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. I say to the boastful, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and He pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. This is God's holy and inerrant word for us this morning. God is a judge, He is the judge. And I understand that culturally, uh, that's a somewhat unpopular idea, but it's, it's on this basis of who God is that all true justice and equity can be accounted for. God will judge the earth. He will judge each one of us, and everyone will get ultimately what they deserve. Outside of Jesus Christ and trusting in Him, that should be terrifying. But not for you who do have the love of God in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 1. This is how it all starts. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. This hymn of the judgment of God starts with giving thanks. God is a consuming fire and his nearness is only a good thing if you can walk through the fire unburned. God being a judge may be a curse to those in rebellion to him, but it's actually a blessing to those whose righteousness comes from Jesus. For us, we give thanks. We give thanks for the nearness of God, for the fact that he has drawn near to us. 
we're grateful for the justice of God. And we remember his marvelous works, the, the great things that he has done. He created all things by the word of his power. He sustains all things. Even now, right now, he is upholding and sustaining all things. All things hold together in Christ. He brought Israel up out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, to the promised land. He established David and his throne and his family forever. He saved us through his death on the cross. He has brought us into the kingdom of his son who sits upon the throne, the true son of David. He has brought us up out of slavery to sin in a new exodus. He saved us. We know what God is like. We know who he is. So we know that he will bring about true justice. He always does. So this psalm speaks to the fact of God's justice, that God is a judge. And it does so in two kind of distinct ways that are repeated. God as a judge will uh, both put down those who are boastful, and wicked, but he will also lift up the righteous. So he does both. He, he will put down the wicked, but yet he will lift up or raise up the righteous. So that's what we're going to try to understand more or see more today. And the way that I want to walk through this is to look at kind of two main, I don't know if you call it themes or ideas in this psalm. Number one is I want to look at Simply the fact of God's judgment. The fact that God is a judge. And then secondly, look at what our response is to that judgment. And what the, the reality of God being a judge, what kind of response does that call forth from us? We'll see both of them here. So let's, let's first look at just the, the fact of God being a judge. The fact of his judgment. You see this as, as God himself speaks in this psalm. Verse 2, at the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keeps steady its pillars. God is the judge, and so he determines the time of judgment. This phrase, the set time or the appointed time, is used uh, several times throughout Scripture, it's, it's used of the fact that God himself set the seasons. He has, he has set the seasons and set the time when they will be. It's used of the liturgical calendar that Israel had, the various feasts and festivals and holidays that they had, that God set these appointed times in their calendar for worship. It's also used in the book of Daniel, of the, the set time of these prophetic events that are going to occur. And so uh, God is always the one setting these times, right? Whether it be something in the future, whether it be the times for worship, whether it be the seasons in creation, he is the one who sets the times. He's the one that sets the time of judgment here. At the set time that I appoint, he says, I will judge with equity. Now, we like to often, I think, question God's judgment timetable. Right? We will see those who are you know, wicked, clearly wicked in the world, and they seem to prosper. They seem to do well. They seem to gain power and influence and authority. And so we say, God, why are you letting them do so well, right? Why, why have you not judged them? Other times we might see others, whether it be individuals, whether it be societies, that seemingly experience the judgment of God, where he gives them over to their sin. He allows them to fall all the way down into their sin, where they're hardened in rebellion, and we might think, God, why are you letting this happen? Why not be more merciful? Why not be more gracious to these people? Why not wait in case they are to repent? But ultimately, it's God who determines the time of his judgment. And his ways are inscrutable. 
Right? When we try to scrutinize them, when we try to, to think that maybe we can judge the judgments of God, we will end up in a kind of absurdity. God is going to make the arrogant low and lift up the righteous and bring down cities and kings and kingdoms all according to his timetable. Right? Empires rise and fall, and it's all according to his will. More than this, God is the judge, and he is the standard himself of what justice is. He says that he will judge with equity. And equity is a term that's thrown around a lot today. What it means here is that everybody is going to get what they deserve. Everybody will be judged according to the same standard and get what they deserve. And God will be just in his judgments because he is the standard of all justice. He is the standard of all righteousness. And when he judges then, it is perfect and holy and good by very definition. So what is your complaint against God and how he has worked in your life as if it were unfair, right? In light of his justice and righteousness and holiness, who are we to question God? Who are we to complain to God about the lives that he's given us, right? Do we know more than him? Are you morally superior to him that you could say, God, it is not right what you're doing to me. It's not right what you're doing to them. It's not right what you're doing to this or that country. It's not right what you're allowing to happen. But God is the judge, not us. It's God who holds the world together. He's the one that allows the kingdoms of this world to grow, empires to rise, and he's the one that brings them down, all the while keeping the whole world from falling apart. So he's the only stability in a chaotic and fallen world. He's the God that sits enthroned above the chaos of sin and death and the absurdity of rebellion. And he weaves it all into a grand narrative of redemption and life and uh, proclaims the wisdom of submitting to his will. All of this he does. Verse 4 I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with a haughty neck. So God is the judge. So don't boast in yourself. Right? You will be held accountable to another. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. This is a warning to us. The, the image of one lifting up their horn, this is, imagine, like a ram, right? Some kind of animal with large horns, right? Lifting up its head, uh, lifting up its head as, as a sign of you know, power, authority. Perhaps this is the same kind of animal, then, that would stiffen its neck and fight against the one trying to lead it. So you get this idea of it, it's, it's fighting, it's pulling away from the one who's actually in control. When you approach the God who holds all things together, would you seek to judge him? I think there's a lot of the way that we approach God. We come to him as if we are on the same level. As if we can judge him and what he does and decide whether or not we like it. Right? It sounds absurd, but I do think this is what we do. We'll read the word of God and we'll think, I can't believe God would do this. Right? We'd look at our lives or the lives of others and think, if I was God, I wouldn't have allowed that. I wouldn't have done that. We approach God as if we were on an equal plane. Or as if we could make judgments about him instead of starting with a submissive spirit, starting with a contrite heart, starting with your ways, O Lord, are too marvelous, too wonderful for me. Instead of starting there, we often start with judgment. We think that uh, we know better for our lives than God does. And this is ultimately what sin is. This is 
This is at the, the core of what sin is. It's a kind of rebellion that says, I know better than God for my life. I know better than him. It's a kind of boast in yourself to think that you have the better way. I know that God is this way and that he has commanded these things, but I know better. All right? I know God says to keep sex inside the bonds of marriage, but I can handle it and he doesn't realize what I would be missing. I know the Bible speaks to the characteristics that I should value as a man or a woman, but when those things were written, he didn't realize what the modern world would be like. He didn't realize how backwards those things would be. God tells me to repent, but doesn't he realize that will give me a poor self-image, right? I need to love myself more, to accept who I am more. That's my deepest problem. Sure, it says to honor my father and my mother, but they don't get it. They don't understand. They're difficult. Every sin at its core, in a sense, is to say, I know better than God. I have a better sense of what I should do. It's to make a judgment on God himself. Verse 6, for not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up, but it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. You won't find true justice in this world. The judgments of this world are at their very best preliminary, right, with, with less than all the information. Human courts make mistakes. Human rulers get things wrong. Our judgment at its absolute best is very limited. True justice, we're told here, comes from the Lord. It is God who executes judgment. It says you won't find it in the east or the west, you won't find it in the furthest parts of the wilderness, you know, as far as you can go. This phrase could also mean north or south, right? So anywhere you go, in other words, wherever you look, you will not find true justice in this world. You can only find it in the Lord himself. If you want true judgment executed in equity, you have to stop looking for it in mankind. You have to stop seeking it in human institutions. It has to start with God himself. He's the one that will put down one and lift up another. He is the one that will humble the wicked and raise up the humble. And we can know this for sure. Verse 8, for in the hand of the Lord, there's a cup with foaming wine well mixed. And he pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. God is seen here pouring out the the cup of his wrath. And this is a common idea, this common image that's used throughout the scripture. The judgment and wrath of God is like wine that's being poured out. Here it's it's mixed wine, so it's spices added. It's extremely strong. And it's being poured out as his wrath is. This tells us a bit about the, the kind of judgment that is spoken of here. It's, it's general in a sense. This is a very, very general statement on the judgment of God. It doesn't go into particularities necessarily. And yet you see that there are elements of it that are both eschatological, that are historical, and also that are personal. It's eschatological in that it points to the very end of time. This is what uh, eschatology speaks of, the, the very end of things. Well, this speaks of that of a time when God will be seated on a great white throne and all the people will be brought before him and judgment will be made. We're told of this cup of God's wrath that is poured out in the book of Revelation. This judgment will be perfect. People get away with horrible and wicked things in this life sometimes, seemingly often, but they will not get away forever we will all be judged on that final day. We will all stand before the righteous God and give an account of our lives. 
and have to answer for every sin. This judgment is also historical. And we see it in the judgment of God on Pharaoh and Egypt. We see it in the judgment of God as he poured out his wrath, the cup of his wrath, on Israel when they rebelled against him, when they abandoned the covenant. The image of the cup is is one of God, again, mixing this strong drink that's so strong that he pours it out and, and those who are receiving it drink it and it puts them into a kind of drunken stupor. Their end is a kind of absurdity and chaos, even when to them it might feel like strength and wisdom. Think of what drunkenness does. Right? One who's drunk might feel like they're on top of the world. They might feel like what they're doing is great. They might feel like they look awesome. But from the outside, you see it for what it is. Right? It's, just, it's a drunken mess. It's, it's chaos. It's, it's absurdity. It's slurred words. This happens when God who holds the pillars of the earth and restrains the chaos of sin allows people what they want and allows sin to bear its fruit. Sometimes we think of the wrath of God and judgment of God as though it's going to be like a lightning bolt. It's just going to be this sudden, all of a sudden judgment. And that does happen. It's not that that may not be part of God's judgment. But far more often, the judgment of God spoken of in Scripture and seen in the world is one of him letting go and allowing people to go off into their sin as far as it will take them. When God allows people what they want, he allows their sin to to bear its fruits. When the kingdoms of man are given over to their sin time and again, it, just, it results in a kind of debased mind. Right? They're blind in their rage and wickedness. And so morally and financially and physically and sexually and politically, in, in every way, in all kinds of ways, when people are given over to their sin, it results in horrible consequences for everyone involved. It always leads to death and destruction and destitution. That is the end of sin. Now, God often in his grace and in his mercy restrains that. He does not allow sin to work its way out all the way in our lives. He doesn't allow societies to just fall apart. He's the one that holds the pillars of the earth together. But sometimes he does let go. He allows people to fall all the way into their sin, to drink the cup of his wrath. This is the end of all the kingdoms and nations of mankind as they rebel against God. And there's an element of this and that is personal. Right? We, we as people are a part of this. God judges each of us and we can submit to that or we can flee from him as he draws near and rebel all the more. We can deny how he speaks in creation and conscience. We can suppress the, the truth of God in unrighteousness. And if God gives us fully over to our appetites, we will experience complete ruin. Again, this is the end of sin. This is the end of wickedness. End meaning its, its final point. This is where it ends up when it's all over. Verse 9 and 10. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. The wicked here are seen having their horns cut off, right? That ram that stands in such pride and strength, which horn is removed. Their power and potency, their ability to rebel will slowly or rapidly be taken away. Whether in history or in the final judgment, each person who rebels against the judge of all the earth will get exactly what they deserve. And you can know that for certain. Maybe that's a warning to you as you hear that. Maybe it's an encouragement as you think of how so often the wicked prosper. People do wicked things and they get away with it time and time again. But it is in God's righteousness that you will see lifting up, raising up. It's the righteous, he says, that will be lifted up. It's the meek that shall inherit the earth. It's those who are humble, 
who humble themselves who God will raise up. It is those who lose their life for Jesus' sake and for the sake of his kingdom and his gospel that will actually find their lives. And so you have here this kind of broad overview of God as judge. Now, what kind of response should we have to that? What kind of response does it call forth from us? We have it here. Right? There is, this psalm is, is broken up into kind of two points where the congregation, again, psalms are these congregational hymns and songs. The congregation is responding to the fact that God is judge in two different parts. And the rest of it is God himself speaking as the judge. So as the people of God, what is your response to be? Verse 1, we give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Verse 9 again, but I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. So the proper response to God being the judge is humility and gratitude and praise. The thing is, this is not going to be your response by nature. Naturally, we want to hide away from the judgment of God. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about, you know, these parts of the Bible. We want the happier parts of the Bible, the nicer parts, right? Let's talk more about love. Let's talk more about grace, right? That's what we want. We don't want, uh, you know, preachers or evangelists talking too much about the judgment of God because we don't want people to get scared off. We want to tiptoe around those parts of the scripture. Why is there an aversion like this to something that entire songs in the Bible are written about? Remember, this is a song. And so an entire song in the Bible's hymn book is about the judgment of God. And this isn't the only one. We sang another one just a little bit ago. There are lots of them. So why are we sometimes afraid of this? I think the main reason that we flee when God the judge draws near, when his word of judgment is spoken, is because we know we're guilty. When you find a vase broken in your home and one of your children runs away, you're pretty sure you know who's responsible. Pretty sure you know who did it. We know that we're guilty and we're ashamed of our sin. We can try to psychologize it, say it's a lack of self-esteem, it's anxiety, it's the lack of acceptance by an oppressive society. But deep down, we all know that there is something unquestionably wrong with us. You can't find a way out of it. There's just always that bottom line guilt and shame. It's because you are guilty, right? It's shame for your sin. And you know that if you were to stand before the judge of all the earth, that you would be condemned. So how can you rejoice? How can you give thanks? How can you start a psalm about the judgment of God with thanksgiving? How can you praise him for this? Because the judge of all the earth has made a means by which all of your sin can be perfectly dealt with. You can humble yourself before his judgment and give thanks for his nearness and presence and praise him forever because you don't have to drink the cup of his wrath. Jesus Christ has done that for you. He humbled himself so that your pride could be dealt with. He was wounded for your transgressions. He experienced the judgment of God on your behalf. He bore your sins, all of them. Every sin that you have ever committed, everything that you wake up at night thinking about and feeling horrible about, every single sin that you will ever commit from this point on, 
all of your sin. He's taken all of your guilt, all of your shame, all of it. He has taken, he has borne. He bore every one of your sins and then he took the cup of God's wrath and he drank it down to the dregs. He submitted to this judgment. You remember when he prayed in the garden. He said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So on the cross, the, the final judgment for your sin was poured out on him. The judgment that you would bear personally, all of it was taken by him. All of this comes to a climax in the fullness of time when Jesus Christ bears this wrath that you deserve. And God shows himself to be both just and the justifier of men. This is how God, who is perfectly righteous, perfectly just, can also receive you, a sinner, guilty. He can do it, still being just, by justifying you on the basis of what Christ has done. So then, Whether you've been walking with Jesus for many years or you just are seeing him today, this gives us the proper response to the the judgment of God, to the fact, the reality that God is a judge. First, humble yourself. And in Jesus Christ, you can see that the judgment of God actually becomes a blessing. The cup of God's wrath is not for you, Instead, what you have is an overflowing cup of sweet wine to gladden your heart. Jesus Christ takes the cup of God's wrath and then he offers a new cup. He says, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the new cup that you are to drink. Take it, drink it. The judgment of God becomes a blessing all through the work of Christ. It's no longer judgment for us. It is discipline at its worst. It is a a heavenly father who loves us, who cares for us, showing his mercy, showing his kindness. Second, give thanks for the nearness of God. This starts by thanking God for the, the fact that his name is near, that he, his presence, is near to us. When you are in sin, when you are guilty, again, you flee from that. You run from that, just like Adam and Eve. When God came walking in the garden and they heard he was coming, they ran, they hid, they tried to hide. That's what we do in our sin. But now, because of the work of Christ, you can give thanks for the nearness of God. By the Holy Spirit, you are united to Jesus in his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension on high. The final day of glory that is yet to come is already, in a sense, present with us. It's already here through faith. And in light of that final day, even the darkest times in our lives are made to be an opportunity for joy. Because we know how it ends, and not just how it ends, we know where we're going to be forever, what life is going to be forever, how, uh, what is now, the, what is in front of us now, the, the, the pain, the suffering, the difficulty, the judgment around us, how all of that is really just, it's a small blip in our lives. Because in Christ we've been given eternal life. So in light of that, everything else becomes a little bit brighter. Give thanks to God because of his wondrous deeds. Don't you see that nothing in this world, no pleasure of this world compares to the inestimable wealth of this mystery, of this glorious and marvelous working of God in Christ Jesus. And finally, our response is to praise the Lord. To praise him. He lifts up the righteous and puts down the wicked. No one will escape his justice. You will get what you deserve. What you deserve. Either you will uh, receive it in Jesus Christ or you will receive it alone. But praise be to the judge of all the earth who has made a way to be both just and the justifier of men. So we sing praises to God. 
Sing praises to God. He will, it says, judge with equity. Hallelujah. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we do pray that you would judge us by your word. That you would convict us of our sin so that we would not live in shame or guilt of it, but that we would bring it to you. We lay it at the cross and know that we are forgiven. We pray, Lord, that you would take these words now, that you would wash us by them, that you would sanctify us by them, that you would plant them deep within our hearts, that these truths would not leave from us, that we would not depart from here and, and quickly forget what it is that you've said here, but that we would have soft hearts, that you would plant your word deep within them. You would water them by your spirit and that they would grow up to produce much fruit in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.